Welcome to Backroom Talk. We're going to chat a little bit about fitness languaging today and have some interesting conversation around the different identities and words that people use to describe the way they do fitness. I think about guys in tank tops, like probably with a nip showing. Uh, I've, yep. been, I've been in that camp. I think. <laughs> I've showed a nipple or two. <laughs> so what is OPEX, Carl? OPEX is doing patterns and pacing in exercise that one is capable of doing. I think most people aren't doing HIT. Like they think they're, this definition here that talks about it as anaerobic to exhaustion. I think a lot of people are doing HIT training, but it's just aerobic intervals. To listen to more Backroom Talk, be sure to subscribe. Learn to design personalized programs with the OPEX system of coaching by heading to opexfit.com. Well, guys, welcome to another episode of Backroom Talk. How are you today, Carl? Oh, man. Gosh, it's been such a good day. Yeah. yeah it's been a good day. Yeah, yeah it has been, hasn't Full it? Full day. Yeah. Full day, and it's only 1044. Those are the best days. AZ time, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let's start off. We're going to chat a little bit about fitness languaging today uh, and have some interesting conversation around the different identities and words that people use to describe the way they do fitness yes. uh, and the way we like to put ourselves in little tribes and boxes. But before that, let's chat about a slightly controversial issue, I would say. Uh, fair to say, right? Yeah, the, definitely. Um, the Shikari yeah, Richardson uh, suspension uh, from the Olympic Games for smoking a little uh, ganja. Mar- marijuana, the weed. The weed, yes. smoking the weed. Where, she, where does she live? Do you know? I don't know. No. I'm interested to see. Uh, where is it? Oregon. She lives in Oregon. Oregon. So uh, it's legal there, right? Yeah. Everything's legal in Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> like literally everything. I think heroin's legal. <laughs> yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, each to their own, right? Yeah. She, um, I think she went to LSU, though. Like okay. She, yeah, I think she ran for LSU. Um, she, I, I, I think she would. She's probably in Oregon because of the facilities and everything that yeah. nike has up there probably because nike's a huge backer of hers got they're it up, they're like our main sponsor i believe yeah so so i mean it's going to be a little bit later when this episode is released so this may not be new new news anymore but she initially received the ban on the 100 meter sprint um the 30-day suspension and then i think just today or yesterday um she's not being accepted into the the relay team yeah, is yeah. that correct yeah, yeah, I think it was, um, yeah, because it was it was just time, right? Yes. So it was like where the where she would have been running uh, in the 100 meter, that would have fallen within her 30-day ban. Uh, the 4 by 100 was outside of her 30-day ban, so uh, everyone expected her to be able to run in that. And I'm not even sure if uh, the Olympic Committee said she can't. I think the verbiage was she wasn't selected to run, Yeah. Um, which I think is... Uh, probably them trying to save face right because it does look a little bit weird where it's like why isn't she able to run and bring home a gold in this thing that she's the best in the world at but because a day passed she can run in this four by 100 so it was probably a little bit of saving face definitely well i've got an article that i'll link here from espn but one of the interesting things i want to draw out and discuss a little bit is uh just the fact that like some other major sporting institutions like the NFL, the NHL have really relaxed their policies around marijuana use and testing for it uh, in recent years. And I think the line here says with the acknowledgement that the drug does not enhance performance. Mm -hmm. Um, So I understand that the Olympics is an international event and those organizations are American, uh, not international, but it, it is an interesting contradiction to allow it in professional sports here, uh, but then to have it be an issue. Uh, with the with the Olympics, any thoughts there? Oh, gosh, yes and no, right? I think it's it's like everything, right? It's like there's there's rules across the board. Um, we don't agree with every rule that we know to be true. I don't agree with some traffic laws, right? But um, you know why ha- why wasn't this talked about before she tested positive? It's because people probably didn't know it was a rule and it wasn't relevant because athletes weren't popping hot for for weed, right? Where now we're like weed's not a big deal. Um, but, you know, at at the beginning of the year, why weren't people like, you know, picket signing saying like, you need to like not have this as a rule and test athletes for marijuana and you need to not have 30 day bans and all of that. Um, but it's just like, yeah, I mean, rules are rules. Do I agree with the rule? No, because it's not a performance enhancing drug. And, you know, 
people should be able to do what, what the hell they want to do. Uh, if it's not affecting others, right. It's like, she could go home and get, you know, annihilated with a bottle of gin if she wanted to, why can't she smoke weed? But that's beside the point, right? The rules are the rules. So, um, you know, I look back to, you know, when I was in, you know, sport and I got tested a lot on things. And, uh, when I was in the military, I was tested a lot on things that were legal outside of the military. Like I didn't agree with those, but I was like, man, this organization is paying me. And I signed a contract and said, I wouldn't do these things. So I'm not going to do them, although I don't believe in it. And if you like, if you listen to any of the interviews that, that she did, um, I think she handled it really well. Like mm-hmm. she didn't blame anyone else. She didn't say, Hey, this isn't a big deal. Cause it's weed. She was like, Hey, you know, there was this circumstance. I was told this thing about, you know, my biological mom. I was uh, a little bit depressed and down about it. So I smoked weed. I knew I wasn't supposed to do it, but I still did it. Um, so is that the real reason why she did it? Who, who knows? Right. But she was, uh, I think she accepted that sanction. Um, humbly. And, uh, she, I think she's like 20, 21 years old or something like that. Right. So, you know, will she be in the same physical condition and the best in the world in the hundred meter sprint in four years or three years, I guess. Um, shit, I don't know. Right. I don't know. I, I don't, I think that's like a, a hedge that a lot of people are using. They're like, Oh, it's okay. She's only 21. She has an opportunity to do like another three or four of these. It's like, she can get in a car accident tomorrow, break both of her, you know, tibias or fibias and be out. Right. Like, so you never know. So, yeah, it was a good opportunity for her uh, to represent the country. It's just unfortunate that she's unable to because of weed. It's a little bit funny, actually. Uh, so I think that that tells you kind of how I feel about it. I think it's a little bit not funny, like for her, but I'm saying like, it's just weird. It's like, you're going to represent the country. You're the best in the world at something and you can't do it because you smoked weed. It's like, whew, that's a little weird, especially today. Definitely. I mean, there's, I think it's pretty much fair to say that like here in the u.s weed doesn't really have much of a stigma anymore like people are pretty over that is it nationally is it legal nationally now is that- um i don't I'd, I'd be guessing um i'm not sure if it's a federal law yet i know that it was a push i i yeah. want to say that it's not because if it was federal that would mean that government organizations would have to follow it okay um, but keep keep talking. Yeah. I'll look that up. no just uh like here in the u.s everyone is like quite, quite outraged and they really don't think that smoking marijuana or however you want to do it is a big deal. Um, But internationally, that isn't the case for all cultures. And we are talking about the Olympic Games, which is the coming together of a bunch of different nations to compete in sport. And I'm not saying that this is right. Still still illegal federally. Okay. Yeah, federally. Thank you you for for that update. No, but just uh, I think there is a much stronger stigma that exists in other countries against Mm -hmm. uh, against weed uh, that isn't the case here anymore. And it is important to consider that when we're thinking about international events, yeah. right? Um, it does not have the same, uh, I guess, following, <laughs> if yeah. that's the correct yeah, word. Yeah. And there's not as many people that are also okay, especially older generations, with pot in Australia, for mm-hmm. example. Like, it's just not as widely done. It's definitely not legal there. Um, not saying that that's right by any means, mm-hmm. but... There'd be my parents would probably be like pretty bummed out by uh, someone you know representing a country who smoked weed, right yeah. or wrong. I think that's wrong, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, I always go, I always try to go back to like what are what are the origins of this thing, right? And you look if you go back to the origins of of why uh, marijuana is, is illegal in most places, um, it has a lot to do with industry and uh, you know how hemp was brought over and was going to kind of take over some things. So. I would just urge people to do some research and understand why it's illegal and why um, governments actually flip that switch from like not worrying about it to making it illegal and like putting it in like this this class of drugs that was like, you know, putting out like the reefer madness stuff and creating a bunch of fear around marijuana. I'm not like a I, I, I think you would think I smoke weed, right? Like I, I talk about weed quite often, but I actually don't. <laughs> I don't. But um yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there should be a stigma around it. Like, I, I just never understand why there's not a stigma around uh, alcohol. For right? sure. Why aren't we testing people for alcohol? But that's such, that's personal opinions, and I'll, I'll leave that out. Definitely. Well, let's, um, let's move on to a little fitness talk then, right. shall we? Another, so, another 180 pivot. Yeah, yeah, I'm all about them. So where did, uh, where did this topic come from? Because this is one you proposed. Yeah. So we're chatting on, um, fitness language and and. Uh, relative to like types of fitness and like, Oh, I do this or I do that. Um, I have a client, this is the second time I'm mentioning her. Um, (laughs) I had a client that, uh, 
I was on a, a call with and she was, we were just having a consult and she was just telling me a story. She goes to this like uh, functional fitness type Globo gym um, in Germany and, um, or sorry, no, not in Denmark, sorry. And uh, she was just like, yeah, like these, this group of people came up to me and they just asked me like, what, what do I, what am I doing? Am I a CrossFitter? And she's like, well, no. And then she was like, I, I had issues like describing what kind of fitness I did. She's like, I just, I just wanted to say, I just do OPEX. Right. But they didn't know what the hell that meant. So we had like a five minute discussion on like, you know, language around fitness and what she is doing. And we just had a back and forth and like, uh, just talking about like, what, what do you think you are doing? And, uh, I gave my insights into that as well. And, uh, I thought it'd be a good topic to discuss because I think, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, either identify as doing a type of fitness or that don't and like feel like it's a stigma to identify to because they don't want to be like put in this like little box right so I think it's an interesting topic and in, in discussion yeah it definitely like hits home a little bit because especially uh you know transitioning out of CrossFit and into doing OPEX individual design whatever you want to call this personalized fitness thing that we do. I've definitely had a hard time uh, describing what it is that I do in my fitness to people on the outside uh, because a lot of people will look at what I do and how I train and the facility that I'm in and they're like, yeah, that's CrossFit. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, not quite. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to be lumped into something else either. Uh, so it, it is – it's hard to uh, hard to reconcile and explain and you end up like in this weird little back and forth where you're like, yeah, I kind of do some things here, but like it's personalized for me and it's like functional fitness, but people don't know what that actually means. Yeah. So figuring out how to communicate what you do, meeting the person that you're speaking to who just has these like preconceived notions about fitness already, that I think is always a fun challenge. Where do you want to start? Let's start with bodybuilding. Okay. What are you doing right there? Oh, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Googling stuff. Um, so I think it's always fun to look at like the definitions of these things yeah. as well, right? So it's bodybuilding is a sport involving strenuous physical exercise in order to strengthen and enlarge the muscles of the body. That's what bodybuilding is. Yeah. I think about... According to, according to um, Google Dictionary. Got it. I think about guys in tank tops, like probably with a nip showing uh yeah I've, I've been in that camp I think I've, I've showed a nipple or two <laughs> uh definitely like pump sesh bro sesh like these this kind of language uh appears to me when I think about bodybuilding um it's definitely like the if if you asked me like 15 years ago about like what happens in a gym that's probably what would have come to mind at mm -hmm. that time uh, in my life yeah it's funny because what you described is the cultural representation of the term bodybuilding, not the actual sport For of sure. bodybuilding, right? So I think that's what's funny when, you know, um, you know, if someone says I do bodybuilding, it's like, well, what does that, what does that actually mean? Um, when I think of bodybuilding, I think of, uh, someone that is doing controlled contractions to improve aesthetics. That's just like what comes to mind. Um, it, when I think of like culture and bodybuilding, I think of similar things, right? I think of uh, how that's actually changed over the years. Cause I remember when I was a kid, bodybuilding was like middle-aged men that were extremely jacked that were like, that had jobs outside of, uh, of the gym. And they would be in at like four or five, six o'clock at night with their massive water bottle and their cut off and their like pre-workout. And they're just like work boots and they're just like getting after it. And you're like, oh my god how many plates does that guy have on that bench press and you're you're like 11 years old like lifting the bar in a 25 or something but yeah back then that's the way I looked at bodybuilding growing up and like getting into like uh college and stuff like that I look at bodybuilding because I had bodybuilding friends so I looked at those people that are just like always you know doing that in the mirror and that in the mirror and pulling their shorts all the way up their ass and looking at like the glute striations and all that like you don't do that uh only at home <laughs> <laughs> i was laughing uh but that's that's what i looked at you know uh that's how i looked at bodybuilding during that time and then you look at like the way i perceive bodybuilding now is is a couple of different ways um i look at like uh classic bodybuilding and like um purist bodybuilding and i think of like 
you know, being in Southern California and, uh, you know, at like an Atlas or Muscle Beach or something like that. And just guys just getting after it and girls just getting after it and just like building these ridiculous physiques. Um, so there's that way. And then you look at like the uh, bastardization of bodybuilding and, you know, us trying to spin it into this and that and the other. Um, yeah, bodybuilding is just one of those weird things that you can kind of attach it to anything. And it's not wrong because you're, you know, exercising to you're doing strenuous exercise to improve your physique or your aesthetics. Definitely. I think it's always interesting when something is like a style of training, but then also a sport as Mm -hmm. well. And those two things almost get conflated where I think a lot of people that are inside of it and also on the outside of it almost get a little bit confused by like what they want the outcome to be. And I think Mm -hmm. it's quite easy to find yourself fall into a tribe and get swept up and excited by that. And it becomes no longer just about the style of training, but like you, you actually want to compete in it. You like, maybe you don't actually want to compete, but you start to adopt some of the behaviors, the like butt cheek in the mirror sort of, sort of thing. Um, If I had shorts on, I'd do that for the camera right now. (laughs) Show some stripes. (laughs) We'd definitely get some likes from that. (laughs) (laughs) Or some uh, dislikes or some thumbs down, depending on how that's uh, perceived. I don't know how my glutes look these days. Ah, They look pretty good. (laughs) 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 Yeah, so bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah, no, but on your point on the confusion around the sport and uh, just like the the way of doing something, I think that's that's so true. Um, But I think people like to be a part of things. I Mm -hmm. think that'll kind of be the theme across all of these different types of, uh, you know, fitness languages and types of fitnesses, fitnesses, types of fitness that people do um, is they just want to like identify with something. Right. Um, And I think just human nature, that's what we want to do. We do it. Yeah. So we can we can uh, poo poo it, right? We For identify sure. as doing a type of fitness. I mean, the other thing that comes to mind with bodybuilding, and this extends out to a couple of the other pieces that we're going to talk about, but I do think about doping and uh, and what goes on there, and I think that a lot of people have that perception, um, and it I guess kind of links nicely back to uh, our topic of conversation from from earlier. But how widespread do you think that is in in bodybuilding? Um steroids yeah and it depends right someone's do, like in the sport of bodybuilding yeah if it's not if they're not like uh saying i'm in the natural um division yeah it's almost 100 yeah. percent. yeah it has to be yeah because if it's not then you're competing in the natural Absolutely. division <laughs> no one no one's like saying oh i'm all natural i'm gonna compete against ronnie coleman right yeah. or like uh or you know phil heath or those guys because those physiques that are being built Um, those things are extremely unnatural, but it's not like a bad thing. All those guys and girls will say, yes, obviously I do this. I compete in this division. That's the, that's what we do. It is a bad thing though, when you have young kids who are coming into the gym and they're conflating style of training with the sport and they want to look like the person that's at the pinnacle and, you know, someone tells them that they, they got to do this to, uh, to get that. And I don't know, that makes me a little uncomfortable. Yeah, man. Yeah. No comment on that. Yeah. I think it's, I don't think, you know, kids that aren't developed should be, you know, sticking needles in their butts or swallowing pills that affect their hormones. Um, but yeah, that is, that is definitely the case. Yeah. Should we, um, should we talk about powerlifting? Yeah. Let's talk about powerlifting. Yeah. I, I did Google the you, you Google definition. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What is it? Uh, powerlifting is, it's a noun. Yeah. Just want to make sure okay. everyone is on. No, oh, it's a noun. Um, a form of competitive weightlifting <laughs> in which contestants <laughs> attempt three types of lifts in a set sequence. They didn't tell you what lifts they are. Uh, that's a flawed definition. <laughs> I think it is too. Yeah, we'll talk about why. But we, yeah, that's a, flawed, that's a flawed definition. Um, but yeah, powerlifting. This is another interesting one where you have a sport, but you also have people who just like do the style of training but don't necessarily compete in the sport and you do get some confusion and some like issues where people are training using the bench squat and dead but they're training as if they're a competitor but they don't actually want to compete yeah I, th- I think um a lot of people a lot of people that i know that identify as power lifters <laughs> non-competing power lifters um they just it really enjoy pushing, uh, you know, their, their capabilities in the bench, the squad and the deadlift. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I know you didn't say that there was, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, 
even if those people have no intentions on com- or in- intentions to compete, they're just like, you know, the work that I do on a weekly basis is to bump up these three lifts, the accessory work, the auxiliary work, the recovery, everything that I do. I'm just like, I want to push maximums in those three lifts. Yeah. I mean, it's just like any kind of fitness, but where I think it becomes pos- possibly, you know, a negative thing is where people just get super dogmatic about what they're doing and take a super old school approach where they're not open to, you know, the possibility of including other styles of training. They're only squat benching and deading from day one. You know, they're doing a five by five in the gym and that's it. Uh, in powerlifting circles, you definitely see some resistance from some people to things like prescribing tempo and Mm -hmm. unilateral training and things like this that could actually be really beneficial for that person that wants to get stronger um and stay healthy as well oh gosh i don't know i i disagree i think power lifting as a whole when you look at power lifting programs you look at like the the people that are on top of the game and power lifting coach coach wise they're prescribing some pretty good stuff and single leg work, auxiliary work. Like they're getting very nuanced and understanding that they can't bench squat and deadlift, you know, five times a week. Um, they're looking at ways to, you know, manipulate volume and uh, tempo and this and that to eventually bump up uh, the, the bench squat and the deadlift. I think that is different. I'm thinking of a bunch of my husband's friends who like still have a barbell in the garage and they think that like the answer is five by five or, you know, yeah. following a Wendler cycle. And they don't, they're just like average, you know, maybe young dads or something like that who just yeah. like to lift weights at home. And again, they're just doing those things and they've all got bad backs and that's feel their like fault. shit. That's their, that's their <laughs> fault. Definitely. Not powerlifting's fault. I absolutely agree. Because we, we could say weightlifting, bodybuilding, powerlifting, CrossFit, yes. like there's people that are in their garages just doing it the quote unquote wrong way. And it's like, ah, but if you did this and did that, it'd probably be a little bit better. But yeah, if we're looking at powerlifting um, as a sport or powerlifting as like this endeavor, man, it's, it's, it's such a pure way of lifting weights. Um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy the ideas that, that uh, a lot of people have come up with over the last, you know, 50, 60 years and how can we, increase absolute strength in the the bench squat and the deadlift there's been some really cool things done uh from like louis simmons back in the day poliquin before that because poliquin was actually into uh the power lifting pieces before he got into the weightlifting stuff and he's worked with a lot of uh solid power power lifters uh then louis like i said um and then you get like you know the the helms and, and his crew over there they always do a lot of really good stuff uh you know, putting out a lot of really good research and relative to bench squat and deadlift, um, uh, Chad Wesley Smith, all those guys like that are just like live and die power lifting. They put out some pretty good stuff. Definitely. It is just such a pure expression too. It is, uh, right? There's something so like, so cool about seeing a person just overcome that load that's sitting there. That is exactly what it is. And it's just them and that barbell. And yeah, it's pretty And some of that purest mindset, like I can appreciate some of that, like the, the, the pushback from like, Hey, I don't need a five zero X one tempo. I don't need this. Cause in their brains, they're just like, I want to keep this as simple as possible. I want to get as strong as possible in these three lifts. And some of the best to ever do it in power lifting, they were very, very successful with just simple, hard fucking work. Yeah. You look at like their training diaries and you're just like, how the hell did you get strong doing that? And the answer for most of those people was just fucking patience. They just did it consistently for a long period of time. A lot of them absolutely annihilated their bodies in doing it, but uh, there's some impressive uh, outcomes from that. Yeah, that that pure focus over a long period of time is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Again, dedicated to just three things. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've learned a lot from a, a few a few powerlifting coaches actually. Um, that kind of like brought me back down to reality. And it's like, yeah, think about this this stuff a little a little more simpler yeah. than, than what you're doing. But yeah, let's that's go powerlifting. Weight, let's go weightlifting, which is a funny <laughs> one because no one knows what it means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does Google say? What does Google yeah, say? Wait, weightlifting uh, is okay. It's going to give us the wrong thing for sure. Uh, already did. Yep. Uh, weightlifting, the sport or activity of lifting barbells or other heavy weights. There are two standard lifts in modern weightlifting, the single movement lift from the floor to extend position, the snatch, and the two movement lift from floor to shoulder position and from shoulder to 
extended position, the clean and the jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was really. I I feel like I I want to create a YouTube channel where you just like go through definitions of things because that was really fun. I was. Uh, I, the only reason I say that is I, I found this YouTube channel on how to pronounce names because I was doing some of the CCP videos. Oh, that's great. And I'm like, I don't want to get their names wrong. So I like went to this YouTube channel. They have every name. Like that's how to pronounce every thing. name because I didn't want to like butcher them. And it was really cool. So that Well, there is my... different pronunciations per country. Though. And they give, they give them. Because Megan is Megan in Australia. They give them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they give mm-hmm. them. It's like origin and then they give like all the options if it's like if you're in this country this is how it's pronounced blah 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 so well, i tried to pronounce it the way that i thought they pronounced it there yeah. was one really interesting one we'll talk about huh, it later okay, okay. Uh, but weightlifting yeah, yes we're talking about the clean and jerk and the snatch yes we are um weightlifting is it's probably just me right but i and some other people but it bothers me when people call everything weightlifting yeah it makes sense though right it's like you're lifting weight so you're weightlifting but when I think of weightlifting, I think of the snatch and the clean and jerk. Yep. Uh, just because of my and our experiences and in, in fitness, right? Like I think that's why we think about those things. But yeah, weightlifting, snatch and clean and jerk. Uh, people that identify as weightlifters are very unique characters. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of time and focus and yes. like it's quiet, solitary time mm-hmm. as a weightlifter, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the outcomes that that like pure weightlifters are going after they're literally just i need to lift the most amount of weight in the snatch and in the clean and jerk and powerlifting is very similar so everything i'm about to say now also bodes true for pure is powerlifting but they don't care about anything they don't care about um aesthetics they don't care about uh capacity and th- like it's just like is this going to help me go three for three in both lifts or not and like hit PRs and the snatch and the clean and jerk. And it's like, it's so interesting being around like purist weightlifters because they're so regimented. Um, they're very patient because those lifts are very, very complex. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to refine in each one of those movements. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do in training that theoretically have great amounts of carryover to pulling and snatching and, uh, you know, pressing a barbell overhead and all of that. So it's organizing like, you know, what, what is actually going to work for, for that person and all that weightlifting is just very, very interesting. Yeah. It's an incredible like obsession with detail and mental acuity that you need to be able to perform those lifts, uh, Mm -hmm. with, with the detail that they require. Yeah. I mean, there's, whole gyms and and clubs that are just dedicated to just these two lifts which is so interesting if you meet someone that dedicates their lives to coaching people in these two lifts um it's uh it's it's like an outcast sport Mm -hmm. less so now than it was 20 years ago but it's uh it's such an outcast sport no one really knows what it is if you go down the street and you ask some woman walking at the Scottsdale Quarter, how much do you snatch? She'll probably like look Slap at you weird. Face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she'll look at you weird. She'll be like, what did you, what did you say? Yeah. Um. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> I think it's worth noting like what CrossFit did for the sport of weightlifting mm-hmm. and the amount of people that, uh, you know, for the first time are exposed to these movements and really learn to love them. And you did see a huge, you know, resurgence in people going into the sport of weightlifting post CrossFit or even doing the two at the same time, which is Why super do you think challenging. That is? Uh, why did they go from CrossFit to weightlifting? Yeah. Or why, they, did, why did it like cause this surge to happen? Well, I, th- I think number one, it was just so many people with hands on barbells that hadn't been exposed to it before. So a bunch of people realized there was this thing called the clean and jerk and the snatch mm-hmm. and they just didn't know about it before and then secondarily you know they were in group class at a crossfit gym and they were doing a bunch of stuff but not really getting great at everything and they got a couple of years in and they decided i want to get great at one thing like yeah. i really just i'm sick of having a list of 10 skills that i'm trying to improve i really actually love the clean and jerk and the snatch and that's what's most fun for me so i'm gonna step away from trying to get good at everything and i'm just gonna focus on this one yeah. thing yeah, it's like it was almost taken on as like a hobby, right? Where it was like, you know, people started CrossFit or some people started CrossFit because they're like, I th- I heard this is going to improve my health. I heard that I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get faster. I'm going to get more agile, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they like 
found this, you know, uh, uh, clean and jerk and snatch. It's weird saying it the, the other way, right? Uh, they found the clean and jerk and snatch and they're like, oh, this is interesting. This challenges my brain. It's like a hobby, right? It's like knitting to some people. Uh, but what a lot of people didn't realize was the ramifications and the amount of work that it takes to actually be able to do those movements is a lot more than uh, a lot of people uh, are honest about. And they're so nuanced that I'm not saying like it's like playing fucking Russian roulette and you're going to kill yourself if you're doing these, if you aren't capable of doing them. But um, with that many people doing anything, you're going to see the sport become bastardized again right like you know you have all these like people doing it and blah 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 but i think that for the sport like you said that was a positive thing because it made people aware that this thing existed so if we go to scottsdale quarter and we ask some you know 60 year old lady what a snatch is she might actually say oh it's the barbell movement when you take the bar from the floor to overhead in one smooth movement it's like how the hell did you know that it's like, oh, I do that as a hobby with my girlfriends, right? Like that's semi-normal now. Like you might run into people that are in weightlifting clubs that you would never think are, right? So I think that is interesting and I think it is a good thing for the sport and it exposes um, it exposes like your, your CJs and stuff like that, the young kids that could have went off and played any sport and been great at it. It exposes them to the sport. It creates opportunities for them to get sponsorships with Reebok and stuff like that and to dedicate – their life to getting as strong as possible and competing in this sport uh, like maddie rogers she just broke three records uh this past weekend that's very impressive would she have been able to do that if she wasn't exposed through crossfit she i don't know but probably not right like she was exposed through through crossfit and figured out like well i'm actually really really good at this thing so i'm going to stop doing this crossfit thing and do this because i can excel at it so, yeah, I do think it's interesting. Yeah, gosh, I just want to give like a little bit of love to CrossFit um, for the opportunity it gave people to experience like a bunch of different styles of training, powerlifting, gymnastics as well, and Olympic weightlifting. And like I ran a couple weightlifting classes at my gym and just like looking at the people who decided that was what they wanted to focus on and like they just weren't a great fit for the everything approach. They Mm -hmm. wanted that one thing, very detail oriented people, often quite intelligent, like really just, again, obsessed with these two things. It was awesome for them to have that, that avenue. And they would not have had that if they weren't exposed with the everything approach at first. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But a lot of those, because I know the avatar that you're talking about, a lot of those people, if you ask them like, why the hell do you do this? They're going to say, I find it challenging and fun. Mm -hmm. Like I really enjoy this. So when we start talking about intentions, it's like, yeah, those are those are solid, right? It's like, you know, those are your intentions. We're aligned on those. Do we understand what weightlifting is going to look like for you now versus a year from now versus three years from now? And they're like, yeah, I'm in this thing, man. Like, let's let's throw this uh, broomstick around for the next six months. Let's get really good at, uh, you know, moving no load and let's build this thing up in progression. Those are the people, like the very analytical people that can see that. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. But then with every one of those people, you have 16 people that are like fucking one RM today, one RM today, one rep max snatch. And they're like posing their snatch and like they're falling on their knees and standing up and their scapula is coming out of their right hip. And then you're like, bro, like deload that bar. And they're like high fiving because they hit PRs. Right. Um, but yeah, for, for every one of those, I think you have about 16. That's according to my <laughs> Maybe <math>. 18. <laughs> <laughs> all right anything else to add on weightlifting no i think we hit it That's let's good. go interesting let's go. interesting people I, lo- I love weightlifters me too let's go circuit training Ooh, this is a good one carl's right, doing see. his little google search yeah let's see what uh let's see what google dictionary says what does no it definition hold doesn't on. have a hold definition on, 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 on. well while while you look for that um and i feel like i've said this before but i my my thoughts around the circuit training go back to my mum having a membership at a curves gym which you like she explained it to me one time when I was probably seven years old I don't know why I remember this but I've always been obsessed with like health and fitness stuff um and you like went from station to station to station Mm -hmm. to station to station yeah yeah. so that's what I think about I think about my mom at curves yeah I know we talked about this uh the other day but you know when I when I think of circuit training uh and it's like truest form that's what I think about I think about walking into the gym and you have like this area you have this corner in the gym and there's like a big sign on the wall and it says one, two, three, four, five. 
and it has all of those machines and like there's a big one a big two a big three a big four and a big five on each one of those machines it tells you what the machine is what muscles it's working how many reps to do how many sets to do um and that it was like a circuit right and i don't remember if it said like rest this after but i do remember it was like do the leg extension and then go do the chest fly and then go do the leg curl and then go do the uh the seated chest supported curl machine like all that right like so that's when i think of circuit training that's that's what i think um when i'm not like diluted by what circuit training is now not that it's a bad thing but yeah what we call circuit training now i mean i think the person that's going into that old school kind of circuit training is someone who probably has a lower fitness iq and wants to show up and do what's laid mm-hmm. out in front of them and they don't really want to think too much for themselves i'm not saying that's a bad thing yeah. um it's great that they're getting it and doing physical activity but they probably don't have a lot of knowledge themselves around what to do in the gym. And it's a good way for them to go in, get exposure to a bunch of movements, um, probably without having to pay a personal trainer, which they might not be able to afford. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's really like my thoughts around who was doing that style of circuit training. Let me, let me go through the definition really quick. So I found it. Uh, Circuit training is a form of body conditioning that involves endurance training, resistance training, high intensity aerobics, and exercises performed in a circuit similar to high intensity interval training, otherwise known as HIT. Well, we are going to talk about HIT. Uh, (laughs) It targets strength building and muscular endurance. That's actually a pretty good definition of circuit training. Yes, I just always like, I'm a little put off by the HIT if we're talking about how we do circuit training now. Which, if I think about how OPEX... Well, let's let's save the hit thing. Because okay. I, I feel differently. Okay. I feel differently okay. than you do on that. Yeah. But I agree with you. But I feel differently. Okay. Well, we'll wait to get there. So, yeah, circuit <laughs> training. <laughs> That's what I look at circuit training as. Um, like if someone says, you know, I do circuit training, I would still think that, right? Like I would still think they're using a bunch of machines. They're going around. Because I don't think most people are saying... Uh, I do circuit training and they're like saying I do CrossFit or functional fitness or mixed modal training mm. or, you know, I, I just don't think that that's the term that most people are using. So, gosh, I don't remember the last time I've heard someone say I do circuit training. That's what kind of fitness I do. Yeah, I look at it. I think I see it most in sports performance kind of environments. So uh, I look at um, some of the stuff that the guys do at my MMA gym and it's like circuit training where they've got like pieces of equipment here and like this here and then this sandbag here that they have to drag this Mm -hmm. way and they're just like going from thing to thing to thing to thing around um less more circuit style and less like metcon where you've you know you're doing an amrap or something like that yeah Yeah. cool all right hit hit yeah let's Let's do hit let's let's, (laughs) Let's hit hit (laughs) let's hit it um this one's very confused all right so Hit, short for <laughs> short for high intensity interval training. Really That's the only Google. definition. Um, so this is actually Oxford. Uh, yeah. So let's get into it anyway. So or wait, actually, I got one. High intensity interval training is a form of interval training, a cardiovascular exercise strategy, alternating short periods of intense anaerobic exercise with less intense recovery periods until too exhausted to continue. Oh wow, that sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> that's actually an accurate. Uh, definition if you look at the last piece but the reason uh, the last piece being until too exhausted to continue um, but that's not the way that it's like put out in in public right now right it's it's looked out it's looked at as like this um, way to efficiently do anaerobic training yeah. it's like do anaerobic training efficiently without spending an hour in the gym that's that's how hit is usually marketed the reason why I said that I dis well, hit your hit your thing on hit really quick. What did you say in the last piece? You I don't said- I don't remember exactly what I was gonna say, but I would just my. You, it, it, let me just you you, you said go, you go for no, it. No, you said um you said that you had like negative connotations around the idea of hit training. Yeah, I think most people aren't doing hit like they think they're this definition here that talks about it as anaerobic to exhaustion i think a lot of people are doing hit training but it's just aerobic intervals uh not if it's uh not if it's if not it's, if not if it's not if you're quitting because of exhaustion for sure but i don't think that many people that are doing hit training in the gym uh, are actually quitting yeah. because of exhaustion they just decided they were going to do 10 intervals and then mm-hmm. they did their 10 intervals and they probably don't actually know how to dig deep enough to go to exhaustion yeah this is a whole nother episode but if we 
if we dug into everything around hit because I, I i did this when it was like really like this thing and like we were talking a certain way about it and we we're like oh we don't believe in that and blah 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 and it's like yes that's true we don't believe in the way that it was portrayed by uh social media and like you know fitness people uh you know prescribing it and saying this is how you're going to quickly lose fat um but all hit training really is according to the research is it's map one that's all it is because of the efforts that you're going at. So it's called high intensity interval training because a short period of aerobic work is higher intensity than a long period of aerobic work. So it is high intensity. You know, this 20 seconds is high intensity when we, you know, compare it to 20 minutes, but that doesn't mean that this 20 seconds is high intensity. So high intensity that it's anaerobic, you know what I'm saying? So for them to say that, it's short periods of intense activity followed by uh, short periods of rest uh, developing the anaerobic system. That's just false, right? It's it, it, they are right. But if they wouldn't have said that, um, if they wouldn't have said that it would have been more accurate. So all it is, is it's map one or like, you know, what we would call like 30 on 30 off. That's fairly high intensity, right? Like that's our two minute pace. We can go like, what's your, what's some people's 500 meter time trial on a rower, If it's around two minutes and they went at that as hard as possible, when you're looking at them, it's like, yeah, we would say that's high intensity. So they're using that same effort in a 30 second block. They're resting 30 and they're doing it for a number of sets. Um, That's hit according to research. Yes. It's not like dying, lying on the floor until exhaustion. I have to quit. Yeah. I, um, my issue with it is just the way it's portrayed yeah, yeah. Uh, by social media and fitness influences and then the way it's implemented. Mm-hmm. And then just the fact that people use it as a thinking it's a quick fix, yeah. um, which maybe it will help them in the short term. Uh, but we talked about this uh, months ago, that research paper that looked at uh, balancing short doses of mm-hmm. exercise with movement throughout the day and the ability to like create this movement cocktail where you're doing a large volume of easy movement and how that is just as beneficial as doing a larger amount of intense exercise and Mm -hmm. shorter amount of easy exercise. So it's when people are looking for a quick way to get movement in that I have issues with it. Yeah. We just need to redefine hit. For sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because there's, it's maybe it's just the language, the the high intensity interval training that, that is misleading, but the uh, concept and the idea for someone that has, you know, progressed to that point is actually pretty solid. Yes. Um, so, and I've seen, I've seen people use that term that I really respect in the industry. Um, and it's hard for me even to be like, well, why are you pushing this thing? But I have to remind myself, oh, they're talking about like, in its truest form in the way that it's supposed to be implemented, not like, you know, blood, sweat, and tears on the floor, and then like go home and try to do it again tomorrow. Key word that you used there as well was progressed yeah. to that point. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are going for intense forms of exercise as their first foray into organized training. And they don't have the, you know, big robust experience mm-hmm. of doing slower aerobic work before getting yep. to those 30 on 30 off intervals. The funny thing is, maybe not funny, but the, th- the beneficial thing is that there's probably some pretty good learning for people that jump right into it and try to do those really intense bouts of exercise because it gives a uh, it gives us a good, a good baseline to even have that conversation. Cause imagine you having that conversation with someone that's never done fitness. They're like, no, I don't get it, man. Like, I, I just, I just don't get it. I'm going to go and do this like 30 on 30 off thing because I can do 30 sets in 30 minutes instead of one set in 30 minutes. You know what I mean? So yeah. they go, they do it. And like they're 15 weeks into their program. They're just like, well, what now? <laughs> and you're like, well, I don't know. Go harder. They're like, I can't go harder. You're like, add more time. It's like, I don't know how to pace out 10 minutes. I've been doing 30 (laughs) seconds, right? It gives you some really good context to start having that conversation. Um, as long as they're not killing themselves. Definitely. Yeah. It's always a fun transition, even for people that have experience, honestly, going from like map one or map three Mm -hmm. back to something like map seven, there's always like a little like (laughs) learning period. I I feel it myself, you know, when you make that, make that switch, you've just got that like first session back, Oh, got to gotta yeah. go a little slower. I'm getting a little excited yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, I'm doing some map six stuff. I was talking to Emma in the gym the other day, and I was like, I'm, I'm tired. Yeah. She's like, why are you tired? I was like, I just did some, like, pretty intense aerobic work yesterday, and I was in the garage, and I was just, like, in the zone, and 
it's humid relative to Arizona right now, and I had like puddles of sweat everywhere. Um, that was, it's just fun, right? Like transitioning from like longer pieces to shorter pieces and learning what your pace should be there. And you're like, ooh, this feels uh, very anaerobic. And then you settle in and you're able to sustain. It's, yeah. it's a fun experiment. It is indeed. Oh, at least for me. Let's um let's finish with OPEX. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go with OPEX. So, what is OPEX, Carl? OPEX is doing patterns and pacings, doing patterns and pacing in exercise that one is capable of doing. That was so simple. Yeah. So it's just doing resistance and aerobic work to to someone's capabilities. Yeah. And like, let's say you run into um, an old college friend on the street and they have no experience in fitness and they're just like carl carl uh carl your your name is so hard for me to say i just have to <laughs> put it out there it's like you look great what have you been doing for fitness Ooh, and first you said, i would turn red <laughs> patterns and pacing might not mean anything to mm-hmm. them so how would you continue to extrapolate that out i think i would just say that i would start it that way because yeah. i think it they wouldn't understand right but i think that's a good opportunity to explain what i mean there so carl what is patterns and pacing yeah so patterns let's start there it's just you know our six basic human movements human movement patterns right so i squat i lunge i bend i push i pull i do some core stuff um, and i do that in resistance training a couple times a week I also do pacing work. So in pacing, I just do aerobic, sustainable work that I'm capable of. So it might look intense to you at some points, but that has been progressed over a long period of time and I'm able to recover from it and I'm able to do all the movements that I put inside of it. Sometimes I'm going out for a run. Sometimes I'm doing this thing on a biker or an assault bike. Sometimes I'm doing it in a circuit format. This is what a circuit is, blah, blah, blah. And I just organize my week that way. So is that like CrossFit? Uh, yeah. You tell me what CrossFit is. I think it's like you go into a gym and you put a bunch of movements together and you do them for time. Uh, no, not necessarily. So what I do in fitness is a, a little more calculated than that. Um, and I'm not saying that my design is like this super nuanced thing. It's just thought through. So it's not, it's not varied. It's not, you know, varied in terms of like what I'm doing on Monday, this Monday versus next Monday. Maybe I'm varying some movements inside of my mixed circuit pieces, uh, but there's, there's always intention behind it. Intention. So if you, if you just describe CrossFit as that, I would say, no, I don't do CrossFit. Okay. That makes, that makes plenty of sense. Cool. Thanks for that definition. Did we just role play? <laughs> I think we did. That was weird. Yeah, that was <laughs> Sorry, really guys. awkward. Emma, can we cut that? This is a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think it was good to play out and uh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to lead with patterns and pacing next time someone asks me what I do for fitness and I'm going to see where that takes me. Um, I'll let you know. I'll let you guys know how the conversation goes. Awesome. Shout out to Matilda. Thank yeah. you for bringing this conversation to light. Thank you. We, ha- we had it. We had that same patterns and pacing yeah. back and forth. And I did that role playing thing for her. So I, you were the second person I did that well, for. Perfect. That's a practice. Well, guys, as always, please uh, make sure you leave us a review, hit like, and leave us a comment on YouTube. Uh, we do appreciate it a lot. And we'll see you next week. Bye.